Welcome back to The Mining Pod. Today in the show, we're joined by Matt Williams, head of derivatives at Luxor Technologies. Matt is an expert on commodities trading and has built Luxor's newest hash rate derivative, a product that allows miners to both buy and sell hash rate. Matt, welcome to The Mining Pod. Thanks so much for your time. Really excited for this conversation. So many people have tried some sort of hash rate derivative and so many people have failed. So it's great to see this product come to market finally. Let's let's dig into it. But first of all, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, man. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be able to talk about our new product. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's awesome to learn about it. Excited to dig into the details of it and compare it against some of the other products that are out there, or products that have not quite made it. Uh, this launch made it pretty far so on Bloomberg, a few other publications, which is great to see. And I think that sort of highlights the interest from miners. It also obviously highlights the growing uh, importance of mining out there. The fact that, you know, we're seeing headlines like this and Bloomberg says, like, hey, mining might be maturing and a product like this definitely speaks to that. We'll start off with a little background on yourself uh, since I think the most of our audience will be sort of new, but start there. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, yeah. So name's Matt Williams, um, TradFi guy. So spent several years, well, actually pretty much my whole career in TradFi world up until very recently. Um, started off as a commodities trader. Um, actually really started trading um, out in New York on the NYMEX floor many years ago as a crude oil and nat gas trader. And then uh, spent a, several years doing that. And then also as an ag trader um, in Chicago, Chicago Board of Trade, mostly soybeans, wheat, corn, stuff like that. Um, from there, I went on to work for an exchange itself. So I worked for the CME group for five years, wore a couple of different hats there, but mostly relevant to this, whereas I was on the corporate strategy side of things and was part of the team that did the go to market launch for Bitcoin futures which in this space is uh, either smiled upon or frowned upon, depending on who you're talking to. <laughs> I, I definitely get both. Uh, and then I uh, spent the last two years of my time at CME, uh, the corporate venture capital side of things. So we had a venture arm that invested in blockchain and AI type companies, uh, f- fintech dis- disruptors. And then uh, two years at a regulator, National Futures Association, before joining Luxor in May. Hells yeah. Okay. So the commodity stuff is actually really interesting to me personally. What's the tie in between traditional finance commodities, working on all these exchanges and Bitcoin mining? Uh, You can go any direction you want with that, obviously, but it's interesting to think of Bitcoin as a commodity, which the CFTC says it is, SEC has its own opinion, but a lot of people are seeing Bitcoin more, more as a commodity. Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. I think, you know, it's not necessarily. I mean, due to the debates you've seen, I wouldn't say it's entirely intuitive that you know you make the translation to commodity. But as it pertains to the product we're launching, we're looking more at hash rate, and we definitely have the viewpoint that hash rate is a commodity um, that's you know widely leveraged within the mu- the mining space. And so, you know, the tie-in is if you look at you know the major asset classes that I've been in. So energy and and agriculture, there's lots of commodities there. And so, you know, we wanted to treat hash rate as a commodity and apply some traditional commodity derivatives techniques to this space and, and ideally kind of fill a gap where there was a missing hedging instrument for people that owned hash rate. So people that owned the commodity of hash rate needed a way to hedge that ownership. And so that's really the, the goal of this product. Before we dive into the product itself, which I'm really, really excited for that part of the conversation, but I have one more question about commodities really quickly. What's the, is there some sort of definition with these commodities that would put hash rate or even Bitcoin, if I want to generalize it more under the commodities bucket? The SEC, we obviously have the Howey test for securities. It's pretty trotted out. Most token peddlers are familiar with it. But for Bitcoin and for hash rate, how do we, how do we define a commodity? and understand that hash rate is a commodity. Yeah, I mean, hash rate specifically, I think this will be something that's fairly new to a space that's already kind of new from a regulatory perspective. So, you know, you can think of hash rate as a kind of like a compute power commodity. And so that's definitely the way we view it. I think there'll be some educational efforts that are needed in the space for everyone to kind of come together and agreeance on that. But 
I mean, you can really just think of hash rate as a commodity that produces something. So, you know, what it produces, it produces Bitcoin, right? So you have compute power and hash rate that produces Bitcoin. And, and that's how we're viewing it as a commodity. It's, it's something that you own that provides value to you. And the value in this case is Bitcoin. Awesome. Okay. I'm sorry to start with the boring definitions, but yeah. I'm sort of sort of interested myself. Okay, let's dig into the product itself. Uh, and maybe we can start from a first principles layer. Miners are exposed to a lot of elements in the market, whether that be energy, Bitcoin, manufacturing, different geographies. There's a lot of things to hedge your market towards. Uh, rather, there's a lot of things to hedge your product against. Interested to know why hash rate? Why is hash rate something that also needs to be uh, hedged against? Like, what is it that is different about hash rate or has not existed in the past that means miners need to hedge against this? Uh, of course, the thing that most people think about when they think about Bitcoin options out there or for, for miners is Bitcoin options or they think about hedging energy. But why hash rate? Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at a mining operation as a whole, they have a number of risk exposures that you kind of touched on, right? So they have their Bitcoin price exposure. So, you know, the goal of mining is to accumulate Bitcoin and many people want to hold it, but they still have exposure to that Bitcoin price, right? The second one um, that's top of mind is energy prices, you know, like, you know, is it electricity or not gas? Like, how are you powering your operations? And there's a big exposure as we've seen over the last, you know, 12 to 18 months there. And then, and then you have your hash rate. And so, you know, hash rate, you have fluctuations in the value that you get from your hash rate that's called hash price, or that's the term that we're using at least. And we can talk a bit about that, what that means. But miners, you know, in this space, there's fully evolved derivatives for energy, right? So if you have electricity that you're using, or if you're using that gas, that space as an asset class is fully mature and there's lots of derivatives that exist for it. Um, Bitcoin, you know, not quite as far, but definitely far along. And there's lots of different ways that you can hedge your exposure to Bitcoin price, you know, some of which are the options that you've talked about. And I still think that space has a ways to go, but the options exist. If you, if you want to have a robust hedging strategy for Bitcoin, you can do it. Hash rate, no. I mean, there's some things that have been tried and, you know, with a modicum of success that exists, but it's definitely not mature. And there's definitely nothing, in my opinion, that fully hedges your hash rate risk. And so that's what we wanted to accomplish was create an instrument where if you have hash rate exposure as a miner, if you're long hash rate and you want to get revenue certainty around it, you know, what kind of instrument can you build? And that's what we've tried to do. Gotcha. Yeah, the energy stuff and the Bitcoin stuff, when, whenever I talk to reporters or I talk to people in the space, like those are the two things that are really tout on. Like you need to be hedging against those. Energy has obviously been something that a lot of miners have not hedged against over the last 12 months, and they have taken a beating for that. From a hash rate perspective, let's walk through some of the details of this. And just being completely honest, I don't know a ton about like how this sort of product would work or how it would necessarily be rolled out. And I, but expect most of the audience would not as well. When a miner thinks of hash rate, you're sort of just thinking, I plug in my machine, I have this hash rate continually going into my pool, and I get Bitcoin from it. I'm more worried about the Bitcoin than I am necessarily the hash rate. But there's good reasons for having hash rating, and there's good reasons for having uh, an option on that hash rate. So I'll toss it back to you to sort of get more of the details on why a hash rate market like, like this matters. Yeah, I mean, just taking a quick step back for answer that, like hedging matters, right? And I think everyone's learned some valuable lessons over the last, you know, twelve to eighteen months. Is <laughs> you, know, you just can't, yeah. you, you can't mine and hold and expect that everything's going to be okay, right? Like, you, you know, while there's a fairly long amount of time period where you had consistency with energy prices and Bitcoin was going straight to the moon and. Um, we're definitely realizing it and suffering the consequences of you know a market turnaround, you know, coupled with soaring energy rates. So, I think what everybody real, realizes now is, in order to stay solvent, you have to have a robust hedging strategy, and that a hedging strategy should cover all of your different exposures to risk. So, you know, as it pertains to hash rate. You know, hash rate just your risk exposure with hash rate isn't just Bitcoin price. You you have Four main components that go into what we call hash price, and hash price is essentially if you if you own hash rate, hash price is your expected value of that hash rate, right? 
but it's not just Bitcoin price. Well, that does weigh heavily into the factor. You also have difficulty, which we've seen very recently, how that impacts your, your profitability with your hash rate. And you have block subsidy and you have transaction fees. And so these four main components go into what we call hash price, which is, you know, if you own one pet of hash of hash rate, your expected value in dollar terms is hash price or, or Bitcoin terms for that matter. And so, you know, the goal of this is to have an instrument where you can lock in revenue for a given amount of hash rate. And so the way it works is Luxor has a series of indices, um, one of which is the hash price index. So the hash price index tracks the, the expected value of your hash rate over a given amount of time. And and the way it works, you know, taking a step back in the TradFi world, there's a lot of derivatives that are built around indices. So we wanted to kind of follow a similar model. Like you can even look at Bitcoin futures, for example. CME Group built uh, an index, the Bitcoin index, and then allowed people to consume that, get comfortable with it. And then they built derivatives around it. So we're kind of following a similar model where you have an index with wide, um, you know, attention and readership to it. And then we build an ind- uh, a derivative around it. So basically, the the Luxor hash price NDF <clears throat> is a cash settled uh, derivative. So sorry, I, I, I'm going to go into the weeds a bit here. I hope that's all right. Do it. I love okay. the weeds. Okay, cool. So if you're looking at like derivatives 101, there's usually in any asset class what you'll see are what are called forward. So a forward contract. So the most basic forward contract is, is it existed for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And it's kind of how actually CME Group was founded. Farmers needed to you know, account for price certainty and the amount of crop that they were going to grow. And so what a forward does is it allows you to set a future price for a future amount of a given commodity. right? And so sellers of forwards will basically agree to a fixed price and a fixed quantity. And that way they can say, all right, so for this amount of corn, I can lock in this price and, and get revenue certainty and kind of build my operation around that. That's what we're, the same thing we're doing here, except rather than being a cash settled... So there's two kinds of forwards. There's a cash settled, and then there's a physically delivered. The physically delivered is the one I just talked about. You agree to a price and you deliver the commodity. Cash settled, everything's settled in cash. There's no component where you're, you're trading in, you know, any physical asset. And so what we've seen in this space you know, previously are these physically delivered forwards where you, you agree to deliver your hash rate at a, at a discount usually um, in terms of the revenue that you're going to have. This is completely different. Basically, what you're doing is you're saying, I will lock in a, a certain price for a certain amount of hash rate. And then at the end of the contract, everything's settled in cash. So if the market goes down and you sold it, the difference that you make in cash is settled in cash. And if it goes up, the same thing. Like You have to pay that difference. But essentially, what you're doing is you're locking in that revenue for a given amount of time. And you can say, all right, well, I'm going to cover my OPEX or cover my CAPEX and be comfortable in your operations. Gotcha. Thanks for walking that out. Let's, let's take a look from like the buyer's perspective and the seller's perspective. We'll start with the seller. So the seller, I guess, could be a one person with an ASIC. They have expected 100 terahash. Your, your product is likely much different than this, but we'll use a very basic model. 100 tera hash over expected period of time. They sell that period of time into the future to another buyer. And that person is going to receive an USD value, the value of that tera hash over a period of time, that value of that hash price over a value of time. It, that's mostly correct? Yeah, I would say that's mostly correct. So like, if you think about it from the mining perspective, you have your operation and your operation kind of continues as normal. What selling this product does is allow you to hedge against adverse price movement. So if hash price drops, as it has been for a while now, you lock in a certain level for your hash price and it goes lower, the difference of what you would have lost is settled in cash. So so basically, you're getting that revenue certainty with that. And then on the flip side, the purchaser also has the opportunity to pick up hash rate for cheaper, right? And then also, there's some risk there that you know, you're know you buying for something, a commodity for a little bit more expensive than you would have if you had the machine online yourself. But you're gaining exposure to hash price, and then you're also getting the option to purchase hash price for cheaper 
than another operator. Is that also more mostly correct? Yeah, I'd say it's mostly correct. There's a number of use cases of why you'd want to buy this. You know, one of you touched on is if you're looking for you know exposure to the mining community, but don't want to have the physical assets. This is a good synthetic exposure to that. Um, you could buy it if you're just bullish on hash price and you think it's going to go up. You could get that discount to spot that you referenced and and you know generate some yield or even potentially arbitrage it in other ways. And but there's also some more natural use cases where let's say you're a mining operation and you've procured ASICs, but you can't find hosting. And in the meantime, like you want to get that exposure, um, you know, to peace shareholders or stakeholders. This would be a good instrument to get temporary, you know, synthetic exposure for that missing hash rate and then kind of make up that gap until you get online. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So now we have the groundwork for how this product sort of works on a fundamental level. Let's turn to the product itself with you guys. And I do want to get back to some regulatory questions at the end of this. So just a heads up that will be coming because uh, I have some wow. questions about that for sure. <laughs> but on the product level itself, let's go through it more in detail. You guys use uh, you guys use the hash rate index itself to understand hash price and create a price for these things. Let's go through how that index is created. I think a lot of people would be curious about how you guys compile all that information. And then from an OTC perspective, how do you guys sell these contracts? Uh, we can get to that question second, but it's very important given that most people have had a hard time creating a marketplace for a product like this. This idea has been around, but how do you create a marketplace for buyer and seller of a product like this? So we'll start off with the first question. I can lob it back to you. So yes, we compute hash price using you know a somewhat proprietary methodology. Essentially, what we do is we take those four inputs that I referenced earlier, Bitcoin price, difficulty, block subsidy, and transaction fees. And then even like the Bitcoin piece, we use uh, we have a Bitcoin index that's basically uh, an average of four main constituent exchanges, and all these go into computing this hash price value. And it's very similar to like a full price per share calculation with some proprietary logic within there. So the index itself is pretty well known and understood, um, you know, in this space at least. You know, I still have to explain it to the Trad Five folks that I know, but um, you know, that's essentially how it works. And then, you know, as it's used within this product, so basically, if, if you're a if you're a miner or someone looking to buy this, you, you basically have to agree to three main things. You have to agree to the hash price, which we view in petahash terms. So, for example, I think spot price for hash price is sixty eight dollars per petahash per second per day. And then you have to agree to a size. So, let's say I want to hedge five hundred petahash, and then you have to agree to a time frame. So, let's say thirty days. So your typical contract will will have those three things. Let's say I want to sell hash price at sixty eight dollars. I want to do five hundred petahash, and I want to do it for thirty days. So both parties will agree to that, and then at the end of it, it's settled to the index. And the index, you know, as we're going back to hash rate as a commodity, behaves very much like an electricity contract. It's continuously producing, right? It's not a normal like. You know, S and P type index. It's it's nuanced, and so to account for that, you have to take the average of all the price prints for the duration of the contract to get the settlement value, and that's all done by Luxor. On to the second question: How do you create a marketplace for this? So it's obviously over the counter, which you know, a lot of people in crypto use Telegram to set those conversations up, but there's probably better ways of doing it. Over the counter deals like this typically involve three parties, right? You have the buyer and seller, then the intermediary who's sort of setting up the terms between the two parties. Are you guys doing it that way? Or do you guys have any sort of marketplace like on Luxor Technologies website to be able to facilitate this? Is it mostly going to be like a hands-on white glove service in order to get the marketplace going? Yeah, these are great questions. You know what's interesting? If you look at where energy markets were you know, 10, 20 years ago, and even to some extent today, it was all done on chat platforms. You know, you have some were hosted by exchanges, some were elsewhere, but we haven't really evolved much in that space, which is kind of funny when you think about it from a crypto perspective, very technology forward, but 
you know, Telegram is just another chat. It's not, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say (laughs) we've evolved very far. (laughs) So to answer your question, like as you build these markets, it's, it's usually kind of manual in the beginning. And like, you do have to go through these chat channels and, and there's some, you know, regulatory things you have to consider as well. So, you know, onboarding a customer, you have to adhere to, you know, Dodd-Frank regulation and CFTC regulation. So we have this onboarding process where you have to sign these, what are called is the documents. And so that's like the securities, I'm sorry, the the swap um, derivatives association, they put out some standards. So these are terms that we agree to in order to be able to transact. And then we also integrate with a swap data repository called core financial. And so anytime we do a trade, we report those trade details that ultimately go on to the CFTC. So we're very compliant when it comes to that, but it's a bit of a burden, you know, from a technology and onboarding perspective for customers. So once you get past that hurdle, it's a one-time thing. And we handle a lot of you know, the lift on this. We try to make it as frictionless as possible. Now we have people, you know, we have participants for the market. And so what we do is we, we manage price discovery by working with the buyers and the sellers to you know, kind of figure out where the middle is, where people are willing to buy and sell. And so yes, to answer your question, right now it's fairly manual, but we're a technology company, we're a software company. Like we're, we're working on building out you know, some more advanced, innovative techniques to do this. And some of those exist today too in the OTC space. So you have RFQ platforms, you know, like Paradigm and others, you know, that are using old models in in the new market. And we'll probably do something similar as well, but we will get more sophisticated pretty quickly. Gotcha. Yeah. It's it's always funny when you walk into learning about how these trades are made, OTC trades specifically, you're like, okay, why is this all done in Telegram? But it's the nature of the beast, right? Because in these contracts, it's dependent on both parties and then the party in the in between setting up the agreement uh, for the trade. So it makes sense. But I think it always surprises people that people do it so manually. I uh, want to talk about specifics though for purchasing something like this. Who are you guys going to allow to use this? Do you have to have a specific amount of hash rate to be able to to sell on this marketplace? Do you have to have some sort of conditions? Are you guys going to vet things? I think that's a problem with a lot of uh, derivative contracts. It's like, is that product going to be there when I need it to be there? And what's the repercussions if someone does not fall through on the agreement? How is this audited? How is this secured? Yeah. So lots of good questions there. Let me try and cover all of them. So let's start with like the requirements for, for being a participant here. There's two main regulatory requirements that are the first barrier to entry, I would say. So if you're using this as a hedging instrument, so like if you're a miner and you want to hedge out your hash rate, you have to be what's called ECP compliant, which is eligible contract participant. And basically that says you have to have a certain amount of money to be able to do it. So for a miner, um, someone using it as a commercial hedging uh, instrument, it's a million dollars in assets. But then there's some other caveats too, like if, that that can make you compliant as an ECP. If you're using it, you know, on the buy side or as like kind of like a speculative uh, investment, it's ten million dollars. So those are the first two barriers right there. From a size perspective, you know, I think we're we're probably going to start somewhat small in the initial markets. Um, we don't have a minimum size, although I would imagine it'll probably be somewhere in the five to ten petahashes. What people will be willing just to play do with my S nine and just get going <laughs> with you guys. <laughs> I'm not sure. You, well, I don't know how many S nines do you have. <laughs> I actually have one right here uh, that I'm not hedged out on. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, actually, funny story. When the before I even joined Luxor, the first thing they sent me was an S nine in the mail. Yeah, I was like, all right, giddy up. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Um, but yeah, going back to your question, um, no real minimum size. I would imagine it'll probably be the smallest would be five to ten petahash, but I think it'll probably be much higher than that. That people are be gonna, you know, some of the bigger miners will be doing five hundred and maybe even talking exahash for that. Um, and building out this market, you know, we've talked extensively to miners, but also it's been very important for us to have a buy side to this too, because you can't have just hedgers in a market. And so, you know, we've been talking to market makers, crypto hedge funds, um, you know, traditional finance people, you name it. There's no shortage of people wanting to buy this as well. Um, so we got a good two-sided market. And to your question about how, what are protections in place? So the is the documents that I referenced before, you have to have those to trade this. And those give you some protections from a legal standpoint. From a financial standpoint, um, 
in order to execute a trade, you have to post what's called initial margin. And I think a lot of people are familiar with that. It's pretty prevalent in Bitcoin derivatives as well. It's definitely prevalent in OTC world. But basically what that says is you have to put up a certain percentage of the notional value of the contract in like an escrow account or something like that to protect default. So we're doing something similar. We're requesting 30% margin. And basically that protects both sides of the trade, you know, against the other party defaulting in certain scenarios. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. From a settlement perspective, I actually look curious on the technical front end. Does everything run through Luxor Technologies? So basically, like if I am a miner wanting to put up some hash rate and, and sell it to the market, it's all going to run through Luxor and then it will settle in someone else's pool account, which would be also on Luxor? Or how are you guys managing like the back end data structure for this? Yeah, I mean, it's important to, to understand for this product, you know, there's no need to manage the physical component of it. So the hash rate stays where it is. We don't even, you know, we don't even need it. We can bifurcate hash rate from hash price. And so really all that changes hands here is dollars for now. And, and eventually, as we get some more regulatory clarity, stable coins, Bitcoin will be part of this as well. But for now, it's, you know, if you want to execute this trade, you post your initial margin. And at the end of it, everything's settled in cash. And so that's all done through our bank accounts. Um, there's really no need for pools or to manage hash rate at all. Gotcha. Great clarification there. And perfect segue to regulation, which I want to talk about at the very end here. It's really uncertain what a lot of these products are because we just we don't have guidance. CFTC says one thing, SEC says one thing. And like you're talking about at the beginning, like we're still having this debate uh, on how to how to manage or detail these things. Uh, there's stuff going on right now with the Agriculture Committee on Capitol Hill about who's going to end up controlling what segment of the market. Uh, of course, for builders like Luxor Technologies, that puts you guys in an interesting spot. How are you guys managing the regulatory risk for something like this? I mean, you just mentioned it. Maybe there's some more follow-up on top of that. Uh, is there a push or should I say like a, a breaking on launching additional products like stablecoin derivatives because you're not sure what things are going to happen with the regulation front? Yeah. I, I, unfortunately, I've been saying this probably too long, but I think we should get regulatory clarity sooner than later, or at least I hope. I think, you know, the, the people that are in power, at least in the CFTC, um, are, are fairly progressive and, and aggressive in getting policy out there. So I think that's good. And I think similar can be said about the SEC. Um, I benefit a bit from coming from the NFA prior to this. So I had a good pulse on like where things are going. But I think, you know, managing regulatory risk, I think it's important to stay in contact with the regulators and, and you know, come to them with ideas before you launch. I think an NDF is fairly, you know, vanilla, I guess, when it comes to regulatory. So like we're definitely towing that line and we've gotten lots of legal and regulatory guidance to do it the right way. But as you evolve and you want to start doing options or you know listed products or whatever else you want to do, it definitely becomes you know more opaque in terms of what the regulatory requirements are. And all you have to do really is look at the CFTC's you know bulletin board to see all the stuff that's coming down. Like there's lots of uh, fines that are being levied on on a variety of different crypto specific groups to see that you know they mean business. And so. For us, it's, just, it's keeping a pulse on what's coming in the regulatory space. If you have questions, run it by a regulator or your legal representation. You know all the fun stuff that you want to do. Yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. As technology builders, you must love that part about this. Okay, last question for you before I let you off the hook here. Curious about what a successful product launch is like for this. First thing I'm thinking is this is launching into a bear market, so that could be tough. Well, on the flip side, that actually could be great because some miners want to hedge their exposures to the market and they want to move hash rate into other people's books. They want to get some cash from it. Could actually be an opportune time to launch this. But from your front, building this derivative, what would be a successful launch for the product? And then maybe say 12 months from now, where would you like this product to be? It's been interesting to me coming from TradFi into this space is, you know, we started working on this in May and here we are in October with the launch. You know, that's light years in TradFi. <laughs> and it's like way too long for people in this space. Like it's it's so different. Um, but you know, we're here. And, and I think what a successful launch is to answer your question is if we have 
a reliable, you know, deeply liquid, tight spreaded market for the mining community to be able to hedge in any scenario, like be it in the bottom of a bear market or full on bull run. Like that's what this should be. Um, it should be a tool where you can use it to get revenue certainty, just like, you know, when, you know, other exchanges launch stuff for commodities like corn or wheat or crude oil or natural gas. You want to be able to provide the ecosystem with a place to, you know, get revenue certainty, remain solvent in any market environment. And that's, you know, I think what had been missing from this space. Although it's interesting, like if you looked at this, if we tried to launch this 12 months ago, I don't know if anyone would even use it, right? Like, it, it, I think we benefit from our launch is people already having learned those lessons that they need robust hedging strategies. And now they have a tool, now they can build it. You know, you could use this to show financiers, like, hey, I have a strategy and an instrument to get better financing. You know, if you want to increase your fleet and not have to pay astronomical interest rates. Like, I think this is a tool that helps the community. And really, like, that's our goal. And, and you know, there are other instruments that have existed or been launched, and we want these to be complementary to those. Like, my goal for this space is to mature all the derivatives. It doesn't have to be just this one. Okay, you, you brought up another question. I was going to let you go, but <laughs> not, not quite. Yeah. yeah. Bitcoin's so cyclical that, yes, a lot of people don't want to sell their hash rate until they. It's too late. So during the up market, like you just said, there probably wasn't a market for this because people wanted their hash rate. Bitcoin was just going up. And so if you were selling your hash rate uh, in a futures product of some sort or a derivative product of some sort, you were basically relinquishing your upside during a bull market. And so most people did not want to sell. That's the same logic, more or less, why people didn't sell their large treasuries for Bitcoin. And at the same time, now we're down market. I think people are going to want to sell their hash rate because it's better to lock in right now over the lower difficulty than we might see in a few months or weeks here. So I'm curious to know like, how you expect this derivative product to live up in such a very cyclical market. Like I think these products are extremely important for miners for all the reasons you just said, like it really helps your books out, looks great for financing, has some sort of insurance built into it, enables you to make a cleaner statement in terms of like trying to purchase ASICs or bring more facilities online. But the, the market's so cyclical, I could see adoption of something like this being really difficult because seemingly nobody knows when to time a purchase or a sell of Bitcoin. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, look, all markets go up and all markets go down, right? And so you you have to adjust your hedging strategy based on the current economics of the underlying commodity. So if you're looking at things now, you know, there's a certain if you're a mining operation, there's a certain hash price where you become unprofitable, right? So now you should be looking at using this instrument to lock in revenue, you know, it, to at least cover OPEX or or whatever your strategy may be. Um you know, and, and get some comfort that you're going to stay solvent, right? Or, or, or to just to like, you know, enhance your current operations. As the market flips and, and, you know, we get back into a bull run, Bitcoin turns around and you see a rise in hash price, you'll actually see, I, what I believe you'll see the market s- switch to being, you know, getting a premium where you could actually sell hash price above spot price. And so basically... In that scenario, you adjust your hedging strategy and say, hey, look, I can actually sell this above where current hash price is and get more value you know, for a short amount of time. And at the same time, you're not selling any Bitcoin, right? You can still hold on to all your Bitcoin <laughs> and, and capture that upside as well. So it really, like, to answer your question, like, it depends on the current economics and how you use this instrument. But there's use cases in any scenario, for sure. Gotcha. Okay, great answer. I love that. Let's finish up hash rate prediction for the end of year. Do you think we're above 250x a hash? Where are you at? Yes, I definitely do. I mean, I, if you asked me a month ago, I would say no way. But you know, with the last difficulty adjustment, I think what you've seen is, you know, ASIC prices are have plummeted. People are starting to buy. There's new people coming online. Obviously, like you know, some people have to plug in to you know maintain some level of revenue. So yeah, at, at above 250 for sure. Okay, above 250. Love it. Matt, where can we find your work, your Twitter account, blog, anything else that you're working on? Um, so at hashrateindex.com, there'll be a landing page for the derivatives section. Um, there'll be ways to get in contact with us. Um, there's a, a form you can fill out if you're interested in trading these products. 
and uh, they, they go directly to me. So you'll be in touch <laughs> with me. And uh, yeah, like we'd love to hear from people either for feedback, if you want to trade, like we're our doors wide open. Love it. Thanks for the conversation. Great having you on today. Oh, thank you. Appreciate you having us.